Um, the next talk is by my coworker and good friend, Michel. Oh, I mean, I, I guess the slide says Jan Michael Löw. Um, I don't think anybody dares call him Jan Michael. He's Michel. <laughs> um, Michel is a uh, smart, great, musically talented, um, is a great role model. He's taught me a lot. Um, and he's very passionate about not abusing the powers we have uh, as developers. Um, and as a consequence, he has written a talk and has already um, given that talk too um, about the ethics of web development, which was very close and near and dear to my heart because he talks about a lot of very important things and um, empowers us as developers, reminds us of our responsibilities, which I thought was super important. Um, so I'm not going to continue talking about the talk, and um, I'd much rather have him say the words. So let's hear him. Hi, NEOS community. Today we have the online NEOSCon and of course it's uh, somehow weird for us sitting here or talking to a camera, but we try very much that your experience of that talk will be nearly the same as you are in the room. Uh, Michel Löw will uh, tell us something about ethics in web development, on ethics on the companies, ethics on you as a web developer and um, yeah, very warm welcome for Michel Löw. Hi guys, thank you for having me, or rather having me remote. As Fabian said, it, it's really weird just talking into a random camera and wondering who will be there watching what you're saying. But I'll try my best um, and I hope you guys enjoy it. <laughs> yes, um, the topic I want to talk today is um, ethics, specifically ethics uh, as, a, as a web developer. And what it means to be an ethical web developer, because um, I get the feeling that a lot of people try to do good stuff on the web and try to try to make great projects on the web. And I'm, sometimes I feel like there's some component missing, whether, whether you don't know how to act ethically or you're forced by people to act unethically. And I just want to give you some, some of my personal personal ideas and my personal insights on uh, how you can go along with your job and still be a good person, basically. Um, yeah, my name is Michel. Um, I work at Punkt.de. I'm a software architect. Um, you can find me on Twitter. That's my Twitter handle right there. Um, if you're curious about the topic or if you want to know more, if you want to ask questions, if you want to find out more about me or about the, about the stuff that I do, just shoot me a message. I'll try to answer that. Um, all right, so let's get started. Uh, many of you might know this quote. It's rather famous. It has become Facebook's company motto, and it's been like that for, for several years. And uh, Mark Zuckerberg said that. He said, we as a, as a web community, we need to move fast and we need to break things. And it's serve the company rather well. I mean, they, they, they've made a lot of money acting that way. But I feel like this, this sentence is somewhat misleading because we've used that sentence on and, uh, again and again and again to, to justify quick development that has not been thoroughly tested, that has been pushed to market way too early uh, in an effort to make money off a product. And... I feel that we as a, web, uh, as a web community have in some ways forgotten what the implications of moving fast and breaking things are. In essence, what I think that we as a web community did over the last couple of years is we fucked up. We've tried to move fast, we've tried to break things again and again and again, and The entire industry has tried to follow that model, iterating fast, pushing to production fast, but it has implications that I want to talk to you about that 
we as a community don't necessarily see at first glance. Uh, I use, you probably do, I do, we've used Facebook a lot over the last years. Facebook has been the go-to social network for millions of people, uh, millions of people, and we do everything, we, we used to do, or we do everything on Facebook. We share news, we talk to our friends, we get in touch with people we haven't been in touch for a long time. And Facebook has an incredible market value. But Facebook also has several problems. And one of the problems, as they found out, was that they have a lot of artificial profiles on their platform, bots as we would call them today. And in the early uh, 2010s, um, news broke that Facebook actually has a ginormous amount of fake profiles on their platform. Some go as far as to saying it might have been about 85 million fake profiles on their platform. And Facebook moved fast and tried to implement a way to, to go around that because when those news broke, uh, Facebook's market value and their stock value tanked because people were fearing that um, maybe the value that they thought was generated on Facebook was not actually true because it was generated for fake profiles. And so Facebook tried to find out how they could get around that problem and they implemented a policy where you as a Facebook user uh, were asked to input your full name into the platform. Um, some random day you would go on the platform and you would get that pop-up. It says, please update your name. We suspended your account because we feel like or we think that you're not using your full name. Please input your full name and you can continue using the platform as you were intended to. Now that does seem like a smart move on, on first glance because, I mean, what's the problem in putting in your real name into a platform? And it might not be a problem uh, for someone like me as a middle-aged white guy who doesn't have a problem with his real name. I mean, the identity that I, that I put out into the world is basically the same that is written in my passport. And so from a business perspective and from a very narrow perspective, that decision actually made sense. Because, I mean, they could get rid of the fake profiles, their stock, mark, uh, their stock value would grow again, and they could make money again. But this decision actually had, had severe implications for other groups of people. There's, for one, technical difficulties, because there's cultures in this world that don't adhere to the same naming schemes as Europeans or North American people might do. For example, Japanese last names can be made up of only like one or two letters. That's, that's not an uncommon thing. And we all know how hard it is to validate a form and to validate a name in a form that only has one or two letters. We fail at that a lot of times. And Facebook failed at that a lot of times. But the technical implications aren't the real problem. The real problem about this policy is that there's people that don't necessarily go by the name that is written in their passport. And that might have several, several reasons. And one of the worst reasons uh, in regards to this policy is that some people might just not feel like their body displays the identity that they want to have. They feel like they're in the wrong body. And for people that feel like that, it's very hard to identify with a name that is written in their passport. They might give themselves another name to express their identity better, another name that represents them as they feel who they are and not what is written in their passport. But this policy doesn't accommodate for that. This policy only accommodates for the fact that you have to prove that you're a real person. They didn't think about the implications. They didn't think about the groups of people that they were pushing off the platform with that decision because they weren't comfortable in putting their real or their passport name out into the world because it doesn't represent them. But Facebook didn't think about that. They didn't think about those edge cases, or at least they thought they were edge cases, because in their narrow perspective, they didn't see it as a problem. What you see there might arguably be, be the first public tweet the first public message that has been put out in Twitter. Twitter was launched in 2006, and this is Jack, at Jack, Jack Dorsey, the now Twitter CEO and by that time co-founder of Twitter. And he was 
probably very excited because he put out the first message on what he thought would be the next big social media platform. This is 12 years later. You might know that guy, he's rather famous. Um, Donald Trump, the 45th president of the United States of America, put out a tweet that has a slightly different tone. In this tweet from January 3rd, 2018, he threatens nuclear annihilation of North Korea on Twitter, the social media platform that Jack hailed in with this excited and funny, arguably, or not funny tweet. What happened in those 12 years to that platform? If you would have asked me a couple of years ago what I do on Twitter and what I think Twitter is good for, I would have probably told you something like, um, you know, it's a great platform. I use it to get in touch with people from the communities that I, that I frequent. I get in touch with people from the NEOS community. I get in touch with people from the Type of 3 community, from the web development community. And it was an interesting platform that I used to further my business contacts. And it was great in that way. But if you ask me now what I think of Twitter, I'm more convinced that it's a platform for bad people to transform hate, misogyny, fascism, and racism into a bunch of money for a couple of white dudes. Jack Dorsey, the guy from that first tweet, as of 2020, his, worth, uh, he, his net worth is about $5.3 billion. What happened? How do you go from an excited tweet to making $5.3 billion on a platform that is used to threaten nuclear annihilation? What caused Twitter to become that go-to stable for racism and sexual abuse of women and fascism? And I think to understand that, we need to look at another company. You guys all probably know Uber. A lot of German cities now have Uber. And I want to tell you a story about Uber, and I want to explain to you why I think that Uber is pretty much the poster child for why we need ethics in tech. And I'm not going to talk about all the sexism that happens at Uber. I'm pretty sure that Uber right now is a very bad company, and they don't even realize it. But in essence, the idea of Uber is great. The basic idea of Uber is to democratize transportation and to democratize rights, uh, to democratize ride sharing. Because before there was Uber, we had two, two parties. We had one party that was willing to provide a service and we had one party that had a need. We had people that wanted to provide rides because they had cars and we had people that needed transportation. And they wanted a convenient and a cheap way to exchange those goods. And that's basically Uber. They connected riders and they connected drivers and everyone, everyone was happy with it. The drivers made money, Uber made money, the riders got rides for a decent price. And Uber had steady growth, they had a successful business and they had a certain standard to which they adhered and it worked well. But then something happened. Investors got a hold of Uber and they pumped it full with venture capital. And don't get me wrong, I'm not, I'm not against venture capital in, in general. I think it's a, it's a very important business driving factor. But most of the time, venture capital comes, um, comes with another aspect. And what venture capital usually does is it changes the goal of your business. The goal of your business no longer is to be a successful, steady growing business that provides great service for your customers. The goal becomes a liquidation event. Because if someone puts money in your company, you can be pretty damn sure that they want to get that money back at some time. And actually they want to make more money off the money that they put into your company. And what happened at Uber at that point was that they started skimming on their ethics. They changed their hiring processes. They hired drivers without, um, without appropriate licenses and without appropriate background checks. And they hired devs and designers and everyone straight out of college without any experience. Usually, as it was in the US, devs and developers that came straight out of college with a lot of debt 
and so a lot of debt. And so they had to, they were bound to that company because they needed to make money to survive. And Uber went on and started bending laws to expand to markets that they weren't allowed to operate. For example, in Germany, where it was a, a huge problem. But what did they do to bend those laws? And how did they get, how did they get away with it? Um, and so Uber um, developed a tool, um, a, a piece of software that's called Grayball. I don't know if you guys ever heard of Grayball. It's made some news in the, in the last years. And what it basically is, is a tool that allows Uber to prevent city officials from figuring out what they do. And it's accompanied by um, a lot of profiling. They, they profile riders and try to figure out whether that rider is um, an actual like private person that wants to take a ride or whether that person is a government official that tries to figure out what they're doing. And while they, they claim that it was used to prevent unwanted customers from using their service. Um, but what I think what they basically did was they sacrificed their ethics for short-term profits to get to that liquidation event. So what happened at Twitter? What happened in those 12 years between, hey, I just set up my Twitter and nuclear annihilation threats? It's a funny thing because if you look at Twitter's terms of service, they clearly state that uh, threatening violence against an individual or a group of people is, pro is prohibited. You can see it right there in the terms of service. I am pretty sure that threatening imminent nuclear annihilation is a violent threat. But why wasn't Donald Trump banned? Why didn't they just, you know, take this tweet, compare it with their terms of service and say, well, no, he's violating our platform. He's violating our terms of service. We're going to kick him off our platform. Well, they implemented something called an enforcement policy where they pretty much make, <laughs> make exceptions for people of certain public interest to stay on their platform even though they violate their terms of service. And what they in essence did was they traded ethics for market capitalization. Um, you know, Twitter used to be one of those online platforms that was never making money. Twitter existed for over 10 years before they made money for the first time. Actually, the very first time they actually made money was in, um, in the fourth quarter of 2017. It was the first profitable quarter in the history of the company. Coincidentally, that was only 12 months after Donald Trump became the 45th president of the United States. 2018, all four quarters was the first profitable year for the company. They made money over the entire course of the year. And that maybe tells you why they implement stuff like an enforcement policy for people like Donald Trump. Because people like him, people that spew racism and hate, they drive engagement on their platform. At least that's what they think. I'm pretty sure that what drives engagement on a platform is, is, is excitement. And excitement doesn't, nece doesn't necessarily have to be a negative feeling. But it's the easiest way. It's the easiest way to get engagement on a platform. Get people who are provocative and mean in, in, in some ways. And people will, follow, will try to follow up with that. And they will end up on your platform. And they will see your ads. And you will get paid for the ads. And this... In turn, all this engagement means money. It means money for the company. They make money off people like Donald Trump. Now you might be wondering, I mean, Twitter is not, isn't just like five people. Why isn't anyone speaking up at the company? And to try to understand that, I, um, I have this quote here. It's uh, from the guy that said it, or he wrote it in a book, is, his name is Upton Sinclair. He wrote a book in 1906 about the American meatpacking industry. The American meatpacking industry used to be not a great place or not a, not a great industry because they practice stuff like repack repackaging old meat, putting it in new containers, labeling it new, and selling it. So in essence, you would get bad meat and they would make money off it. And Upton Sinclair analyzed that industry, and he, he wrote a book about it. 
And in his book, he says, it is difficult to get a man to understand something when his salary depends upon his not understanding it. And that's pretty much it. Why should I change something about my company if I'm able to make money off it? Another tweet, um, this one is by Evan Reiser. He used to be head of Twitter development team. And in that photo you see actually the entire core product team of Twitter in 2017, that is. Do you notice anything about that photo? Um, yeah, it's a, it's a bunch of dudes. There's not a single woman in that photo. And I think that that is actually the core issue that Twitter has. Because if you're, I don't know, a 30-something privileged guy, you don't necessarily see racism and harassment and abuse as a problem. Not because you think it is, not because you think it is all right, but because you don't think about it at all. We have this thing in tech, um, <laughs> it's called bro culture. Because most of our companies are made up of middle-aged bros and they work together and they, they develop their projects and they put out products into the world that have been tested by other bros. And so they don't necessarily see any problem with that. Uh, in 2018, Emily Chang wrote, um, wrote a pretty great book about that. It's called Brotopia. Um, and she, she dives into many of the issues that um, plague tech communities and, and tech companies. And what I think what happens when you have only white guys or middle-aged, privileged guys in a team, you, you very quickly start declaring other groups as so quote-unquote edge cases. What I think what an edge case is, is not, is not an edge case, but it's a, con it's a conscious decision to ignore certain groups of people. And sometimes that group of people can just be all the women in the world. <laughs> um, and therefore, I think there is no such thing as an actual edge case. Um, what we as devs are saying when we say, well, this is an edge case, we're not going to think about that. It's... What we're saying is, I don't, care, I don't care enough about that group of people to worry about that. We make a conscious decision to ignore, uh, to ignore a, s a certain part of people for the sake of simplicity. But the results can be disastrous. You know, edge cases are fine when your customer base is like 100 people. And you don't reach 1% of them because that's just this one person. I mean... It's bad, but if your product is, I don't know, a certain energy drink and one person doesn't want to drink it because there's sugar in it, it's not that big of a deal. But the thing about edge cases is they don't scale. Well, they do scale, but they scale very bad. Because 99%, that leaves just 1% error margin. But take Facebook, for example. Facebook, those numbers are a bit old, but... In 2019, they had about 1.6 billion active users every day. And 1% of that, that's 160 million people that you leave out because you think, well, they're an edge case. And that's only with a very small margin. Tech companies oftentimes, I think, treat the protection of their users and the protection of their personality on their platform as an, off, as an afterthought. But I firmly believe that we as a tech community have the responsibility to protect our users and we have the resp uh, responsibility to, pre uh, to protect their data. And we need to give them ways to protect themselves from harassment and abuse on their platform. And we can't treat that protection as an afterthought. It needs to be baked into the core of the products and services that we develop. We need to think about edge cases, or so-called edge cases, while we design the platforms that we design, not later on. What happens when you, I don't know, plug, this, plug protection into your platform afterwards um, can be pretty pretty greatly seen um, by example of the Twitter reporting dialogue. You know, there, 
Twitter at some point realized, oh, well, we have a problem with racism and abuse and, and harassment and violence on our platform. And they implemented a way to report tweets. So you can scroll through your timeline. And when you see something that is offensive to a certain group of people, you can say, well, I want to report that. Actually, I do that a lot. It's, I wouldn't go so far as to say it's fun, but it feels good to do that. And it sort of became a hobby of mine. So I just, I go through my timeline and every time I see something, every time I break into a certain bubble of people who do, do stuff like that, you can go through there and you can report bunches of people. It's fun, try it out sometimes. But at least for Germany, I mean, this example is, it's, it's the German dialogues. I mean, those of you who speak German might be able to read that. Those of you who don't, I'm sorry about that, but this dialogue actually only appears in Germany because we have a, um, we have an, a, a rather new law in Germany. It's called the Netzwerk Durchsetzungsgesetz, which is uh, aimed at giving authorities, like um, like government officials, more um, more ways in trying to trying to follow up with people violating laws and harassing people online. And to accommodate that, Twitter had to change their reporting dialogue, and so it became what you see there. Um, the thing about that Netzwerkdurchsuchungsgesetz is that Twitter has to proactively differentiate which laws have been broken by the time that you report something. And now I'm, I'm not a lawyer, I'm a software architect, so I'm not entirely sure what laws have been violated when someone spews racism and hate on their platform. But in the Twitter reporting dialogue, I have to pick one of the, of the given paragraphs from the Strafgesetzbuch, the German Criminal Code, um, and I have to say, well, I report this tweet because this law has been broken. So that's the first hurdle. And so what I usually do is, well, I try to, well, um, usually I go for like, I don't know, display of violence. If someone is displaying violence, I try to make an informed decision what I choose there. But I'm not a lawyer. I shouldn't be forced to do that. There should be people who know the law that decide what happened. But once you got past that first paragraph, you get the second paragraph, uh, the second page. And let me just highlight something there. Um, this, uh, this paragraph right here, I, I translated that for you. What it says is, I understand that the reported user, well, the one I just reported, will be notified and that this issue will be forwarded to the Lumen database shown in the Twitter transparency report and can be added to legally required public reports and reports to authorities. That doesn't sound like something I want to do to someone that has, for example, sexually harassed me. I mean, again, I'm a, I'm a middle-aged white guy. I have never been sexually harassed. But I can imagine what that means for, say, a woman that has been sexually harassed. Because the worst thing for someone like uh, someone that has been harassed is for their oppressor or their or the person that harassed them to find out that they did something about that. And so what, what I read from this paragraph is, well, okay, well, I'm going to report this person. And what's going to happen then? Is there going to be like a public, a public display of all the people that have been uh, reported? Is my name going to be on there? I don't know that. But the mere fact that there might that my name might appear on one of those lists is it's a very dangerous thing as i said if you have been harassed and the worst thing that can happen is that um the person finds out that you reported them and if they get them i don't know what it says maybe maybe they get a message that well this and that person has reported you and that is that is not only bad that is that is actual that's actually dangerous for the people who do that it is actual physical danger for the people that, that are subject to their oppressors finding out that they did something about that. And that, this dialogue, is exactly what happens when the protection of your users is not baked into your platform, but it's just put on afterwards. 
It's what happens when none of your team has actually been on the receiving end of those, of, of those things. That bias is, is evident in a, lot of, in a lot of things. Amazon tried to streamline their hiring process and they came up with, a, with an AI that screens, um, that screens applications. But what happens if a room full of white dudes develops an AI and that AI learns from them? Well, it's gonna be biased. It's gonna be biased against everyone that is not a white dude. And so when Amazon at least learned that it's a bad thing, not long after a public outcry. <laughs> um, and just to show you that it's not just a tech community problem, um, this example is from a German company that tweeted something about um, International Women's Day. It's five white guys talking about women that have influenced them. The article is horrendous, it's sexist, it's, it's terrible. Please don't, don't, don't read that. I mean, the link is in there, but don't read that. And the problem is that they don't understand that there's something wrong with that. Because in their bubble, in their life, I mean, well, yeah, well, of course our board of directors is only white guys. Why shouldn't it be otherwise? And so, of course, those five guys on the board of directors are going to put out a tweet saying, well, you know, my mom influenced me greatly because she stayed home and took care of us as kids. You know, we don't even, uh, oftentimes we don't even think that not having women or minorities in our development teams is a problem. And when they get into our teams, we belittle them. We don't take them, we don't take them seriously because, well, after all, they're just women. I mean, look at tech schools. I don't know how long it's been since you went to, to like college and I don't know, maybe some of you started, uh, studied IT and you probably never wonder why there's only, why there's 95, 95% are men. Because we, well, we look at that and we think, well, maybe women aren't interested in those fields of work, but they are. We just don't give them a chance to participate in the way that they should be participating to prevent stuff like that from happening. You see, the problem is oftentimes we think that, oh, well, we don't have women in our teams, but I mean, we can empathize that we can we can put ourselves in their shoes and we can try to figure out what's wrong. And then we'll come up with solutions for the problems that we think they have. But empathy is not a substitute for diversity. You can't empathize something that you've never experienced. It's just it's just the way it is. And if your team is made up of 30-something white guys, your products will only cater to those 30-something white guys because you can't empathize what it means to be a, a woman on the receiving end of harassment. I can't, for my part. You know, we, we put a lot of trust in certain professions. Say doctors, for example. Doctors go to, go to medical school, they go to college for a long time, they learn a lot of stuff about their profession, and we trust them. We trust them to do their job right. Would you want to drive over bridges that have been built by a civil engineer that never went to college? You probably wouldn't. But the fact that they go to school and that they learn and that, that we have standards for their education makes us trust in them and it's proven right for the most part. You know, Elon Musk tried to push into the medical field. They tried to come up with like, um, like a, a brain machine interface, they call it Neuralink. And what it basically does is they implant a chip into your head and they try to communicate with a chip in your brain. They try to use it to compete with AIs because the human brain is far superior to AIs, at least at this point. But it's basically a tech company meddling in your most private data, your brain, your thoughts. They try to use them to do stuff. So do you trust web devs to do their job right? I, for the most part, don't because I am one and I know I screw up all the time. I wouldn't trust myself with putting a chip in my brain and doing stuff with that. 
and I'm not, I'm not certified to handle the most personal of users' information. That's why we have laws that prevent us from doing so. We have uh, the infamous GDPR um, because we've proven again and again and again that we're not capable of handling those things responsibly. But what can you do? I mean, I've, I've talked about what is bad and what's, <laughs> what is wrong with the community, but what can you do? Well, for that, I, only have, I actually only have two words for you. And the first word is why. It's a question, so it's why? I don't know. <laughs> Take that word and use it. Use it to ask the question, why are we building what we are building as a community or as a team? Or why are we building the project that we are building? And more importantly, why are we building it the way that we are building it? And why is that so important? Because you might not realize that, but as a dev, you don't actually work for your client. This might sound surprising for some of you because, you know, there's a contract you have with your client and you sign that contract and so you're obliged to fulfill that contract. But actually, you're not working for your client. You're working for your client's customers because what you do will inevitably be used by them. And so, even though your client pays you, they pay you for your expertise and for your services, and you're probably hired because you're the best for the job. But you don't work for them, you work for their customers. And you should never forget that in working for their customers, you carry a huge responsibility. Because you want to solve a problem that your client's customers have. And to solve those problems, you don't necessarily have to build a, build a product that satisfies your client. But you have to build a product that satisfies your client's customers' needs. And it's very important to differentiate between that. And while you develop the project, you're actually the only one that can, that can protect your client's customers from your client. Say if you work for Facebook and Facebook wants you to implement a real name policy, you might just go ahead and ask, well, why are we doing that? And why are we doing that in the way that we are doing it? And in doing so, you can find out why your client wants the product to have, uh, wants the product to exist and wants to, wants to implement it in a certain way. And in asking why often enough, you will probably be able to follow the money. And that's very, very important because, well, in business at least, all the, decision, all the decisions that are made by your client have a certain monetary motive. And it might not be a good one, as is evident in, for example, Uber. Uber's financial motive led to them breaking laws and led to them hiring bad drivers and led to their customers being hurt in the process. And if you don't know your client's motives, and if you don't know what motivates them to do a certain thing, you have to find out. And in order to find out, you have to demand a seat at the table. You need to be in the place where those decisions are made. You can't make your voice heard if you're not in a room. You need to be where those decisions are made. Demand a seat at the table, especially if you're a woman or part of a minority that usually gets overlooked by all the other white dudes in the room. You have a lot of power when you're on that uh, at that table because you can use the second word and it's even more powerful and even more important. Second word is no. No one can force you to implement a certain feature. No one can force you to do stuff the way that your client wants you to do that. You have an ethical responsibility to say no to stuff that you feel is inherently bad. You know, we're always told to, to act humble. We're always told to, well, you know, you're young, you don't know stuff. You're a woman, you don't know stuff. You're from a minority, you don't know stuff. But you can't change anything if you hide behind that humbleness. Because I, I'm, I'm fairly certain that your humility 
is just a wrapper for your fear. You fear to be exposed by other people because you say no to something that other people agree on because you feel it's right. And you might end up at a certain place where you feel like you're in a place where you shouldn't be because you feel you're not worth to be, you're not worthy to be at that table because you're, I don't know, a bad developer or you're too young or you're a woman. We call that imposter syndrome and it, you've probably all experienced it. It's that feeling you get when you're, you're sitting in a meeting and you really wonder, why am I here? I don't have anything to bring to the table because I don't know anything. And let me just tell you about imposter syndrome. Imposter syndrome is bullshit. You know, there's only, there's only two reasons why you are where you are right now, as in for, for your work at least. The first scenario is everyone you've ever worked with and everyone who's ever had to evaluate the stuff that you do and had to work with you is an idiot. Because if you're, if you're so bad at your job that you feel that you're wrong in a place, well, I mean, everyone that you met before that has to have made a wrong decision and has to have evaluated you wrong, so they must be stupid, right? Or the other scenario is you're just as good as you think you are. And if you realize that you're just as good as you think you are and that you're right where you are, you get a lot of power because from that confidence, you can gain a lot of power because you are an expert. I mean, why else should anybody hire you? You're an expert. You know what you do. But you weren't hired to please your employer. You were hired to do the right thing. And to do the right thing, you have to stand up and fight. You have to fight for the right thing and fight for the good thing because no one else will do it. I mean, look around you, look at the tech companies. No one is fighting for the good thing. And I sometimes hear that people say, well, you know, I don't know, my company implements a product that harass, that gives people the, the ability to harass women. But on the weekend, I do stuff for open source communities. You know, I, I improve the Neos backend UI. And that's, that's a really good thing. That's a great thing. Open source projects and work for open source projects is really important. And it's a very important tool to democratize the internet as the way it was intended to. But there is no karmic wheel in web development. You can't make up for the bad things you do Monday to Friday with the good things you do Saturday and Sunday. It's not how it works. You need to know that you have to fight the good fight every day of your working, of your working life. Every day you need to make sure that the stuff you put out into the world is good and doesn't harm people. And you need to make people aware of the issues that come from less diversity and not having diverse teams and not being inclusive to other groups of people. And you can actually see that this works. If you have even remotely followed the news in the last weeks, there has been an outbreak of protests all over the world um, for rights for black people. It started in the US because I mean, it's a poster child for a society treating people wrong. And people spoke up about it and they went to the, they took to the streets and they started protests and it had an impact on our community because people did the right thing. For example, Amazon, who is an, who is pretty much a technology leader in facial recognition technology, they vowed to not let police enforcement use their technology for at least a year. I mean, it's something. But this didn't happen because, I don't know, some business evangelists thought, well, maybe we can get, make more money off that. No, it's because someone from the inside said, well, no, what we do is wrong. We need to do something about that. Same with IBM, uh, also in the wake of the, of the recent demonstrations. IBM stopped developing facial recognition technology that can be used by, for example, uh, for example, law enforcement agencies. And that's what you have to do. You have to stand up and fight. Fight for the good stuff. Make sure that nothing that could harm people is put out into the world. 
And if you don't see that you can change something, well, you have to get up and leave. No one forces you to work for a company. I mean, it's different in the US where you don't have like certain social security networks, but at least in Europe, nothing is gonna happen if you get up. I'm pretty confident that the only thing that's gonna happen if you get up and leave is that some other company that has better values is gonna pick you up because they see that you're a good person. And there you can do the good stuff. So ask why. Say no, fight for what you believe is right. And if you don't see any way out, just leave. There's no excuse for putting out bad stuff into the world. There's simply no excuse. Your job is to take care of the world around you and to take care of the people around you. Because if you don't do it, no one's gonna do it. We as a tech community have an incredible strength in this world that we don't even realize. We need to remember what kind of power we have as a community and we need to start caring for the people around us. If we don't, no one is gonna do it. So go out and take care of the people around you. Take care of the world around you and do the good stuff. If you would like to learn a bit more about the topics that I just talked about, um, there's some books that I highly recommend you reading. I mentioned most of them in the talk. The first one is Ruined by Design by Mike Montero. And this is actually where most of the ideas for this talk came from. Mike Montero is a, is a San Francisco-based designer. He's a great guy. He's a weird guy. He's very angry, but he has a lot of important stuff to say. Uh, the second is Design for the Real World uh, by Viktor Papanek. I haven't talked about that in all detail, but he lays out a pretty clear path what it means to be an ethical designer. Uh, third one is um, Brotopia, I told you about that, by Emily Chang, about bro culture and white dudism and tech in the US. And the last one is The Jungle by Upton Sinclair, it's where the quote is from. Just go ahead and read it if you really wanna be worried about meat industries. <laughs> right, those are my images. Thank you guys for watching. Thank you for listening to me rant for almost 50 minutes. <laughs> Thank you for having me at NeosCon Online 2020. And I hope to talk to you soon. Hi. Wow, that was uh, impactful. Michael, do we have you here? Hi. Oh, you got your hair Hi. cut. <laughs> you look lovely. I did yesterday. Congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> congratulations well, it's, it's been a while congratulations I mean, for you looking you saw me every morning it's gotten worse and worse congratulations for looking less <laughs> fuzzy than last time i saw you um i have been um watching the the responses that your talk has been getting on our various various um chats it's been overwhelmingly positive a lot of people say that this is such an important thing to talk about um one person talked about having run into problems themselves with best intentions and hurting communities because they weren't they just weren't on their radar so it's obviously something that touched like base on all levels here uh, also my mom says hi she really <laughs> likes she really liked your talk and she thinks it's great that i as a woman work in a community that clearly values these things so mom says hi um <laughs> Also, um, so you, when you recorded your talk, this whole thing with Trump and Twitter was just starting to explode, right? I'm just going to recap real quick for people that might not be um, on top of everything. Um, Trump claimed in a tweet that mail-in voting would um, promote voter fraud. And uh, Twitter <coughs> fact-checked that tweet and uh, hid it. They kept it up, but left a disclaimer saying um, that this has been proven wrong. And then um, Trump signed an executive order that will in future restrict the freedom that social media platforms have in policing the content that is published on there. Um, so do you think like, is Twitter smart in covering their tracks and covering their bases? Or like, where do we go from here? Uh, I think 
I think it's a, it's the right thing to do if you've maneuvered yourself in such a bad corner that that's the only way you know out. I mean, they've made wrong decisions over and over again over the last 13 years, and this is where we ended up. And so they had to uh, do something about it. And I still think it's the wrong choice to, to leave a person like Donald Trump on the platform and to let them still have that public voice because the stuff can still be seen. And if you're deep into a bubble enough, you're not going to realize that that fact checking might actually be worthwhile reading, but you're just going to see the tweet and you're going to see the, the fact checking underneath it. And you're going to be like, well, that's going to be fake news too. So I'm not going to, not going to read that. I'm not going to worry about that. So you're, you, you don't really get a chance to, to break people out of their bubbles by doing stuff like that. I personally think that the only actual like smart decision would be to kick people like him with a platform and not give them a public voice. Radical choice. Um, I think it's we still have a- better than what Facebook is doing because they're not doing anything claiming it's free speech. But um, yeah, and that's the choice they're having they're- right now, because um, I, th- I think I saw on what's one of the pro Trump TV channels, news channels that he's a fan of. They said that Fox News said that um, that by marking things as fact checked or hiding them they were no longer acting as um, social media platforms where anybody can express themselves but are rather starting to act in the form of um, p- publishers um, and that's the point where they're where they're trying to restrict that um, we just had another question coming in I'm not sure if it's from our tech team or from the chat um, and the question is, do you know the motives behind IBM slash Amazon saying no to facial recognition? Could in fact still be, and then I can't read because it's cut off. Could in fact still be money. I th- money. Could in fact still be money. So, uh, well, it could very well be money. I don't, I don't know what their motives are. I mean, I, I have a slight sliver of hope in my in my soul that it might actually be good people making the right decisions but i mean i i try to i try to s- try to explain that i'm not i'm not against venture capital in general i, I said that in the talk because i don't think that all bad decisions are motivated by money and all good decisions aren't motivated by no money that's not i mean a good decision motivated by money is still a good decision and so I'm not, I'm not completely worried about why they did it. I mean, at least they did something. It's the same with uh, with Twitter fact checking. I mean, at least they did something. But yeah, I don't, I don't know what the motives are. Next question. Um, sorry, I'm, I'm getting <laughs> input. Um, <laughs> um, and then we also talked about the the two of you. Um, that you make this very radical statement of get up and leave. Does that mean just because the company that I work for works for someone that want to do, and then I just quit my job and like, what? Tell me. The thing is, um, once again, talking from a privileged standpoint, for me, it's very easy to say, well, I don't like the way you're going. I'm not going to go that way with you because, well, I'm a middle-aged white guy. It's not hard for me to find a job in, in Europe. I'm middle-aged. How are you middle-aged? Don't laugh at that. I'm 30. Um, you just offended a lot of people. <laughs> um. No, but what I what I'm trying to say is, um, it's it's a very radical statement. I don't mean it in the way of, well, oh, there's an obstacle in my way, and I don't want to deal with it. I'm just going to quit. Fuck you. Sorry about that. Um, but <laughs> don't worry, we have a delay just for um, that. Yeah, it's fine. Beep. Um, what I'm trying to what I'm trying to say is that there's no reason to at least for the most part, there's no reason to in, to endure working for a company that does bad things. There's, I mean, it's it's a measurement of last resort, you could say, but 
it's still a possibility to just realize that you're in the wrong place and that you don't want to be there. And I, I do know that it's difficult for, for, for example, people that are here on a, on a, on a work visa or something, if they lose their jobs, they, they threaten their, their ability to stay where they are. And, and, and that's, that's dangerous. And I, and I mentioned the, like, the college debt thing, which is not a huge issue in, for example, Germany, but it's a huge issue in the U.S. People need to stay with the company they are in because, I don't know, they covered their student loans. And so it's it's a very difficult statement. And I know it's a very placative statement, but I still think that you should consider it if you don't see a way out like, I think, off, the, off the bad stuff that the company does. I think as a last resort measure definitely makes sense um but i think like i just, I just want to make sure that nobody understands this uh, understands your statement as everybody that works for twitter as a developer is a horrible human because they support it because a lot of them i mean we've been seeing more and more of that of people working at twitter and at facebook um that stage uh walkouts because they are opposed to how things are running so you know, not everybody that works there is a horrible person because they're trying to change it from the inside rather than giving up. Yeah, but to actually be able to change something from the inside, you need more people. And that's, again, that's a U.S. problem. They don't, they don't have labor unions, so people don't organize. They, ha they don't have any protection, so they can't do anything about that. And that's why, at least for, like, European countries, you are in a very, very comfortable position because you, you can... I don't know, you can make your voice heard and no one can actually do something about that. I mean, they can fire you after three months, but you still have social benefits and you're not going to, like, your drop is very cushioned. And so you actually have a lot of power. You just need, you just need to use that. All right. I think we're out of time. I mean, I know we, we're, we agree on most of these things. We've talked about them plenty of times. <laughs> Um, thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for your talk. I You're haven't, welcome. because I've been talking to you, I haven't checked back in the chat, but I'm pretty sure uh, last I saw everybody was way on, on, your, on the same page with you there. Um, see you soon. <laughs> see ya. And, uh, and thank you. Again, if you guys want to talk to me, I'm on, I'm on Twitter. You can, you can shoot me a message. I'm in, uh, in the Slack channel. You can hit me up there. Um, I'd be glad to talk about it. Cool. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye, guys.